as confused, <laughs> funny, but as confused as Kramer is about marriage, so is our culture. We've been talking about God's blueprint for marriage, and unfortunately, our world has bought into um, man's thinking. We've scribbled some ideas on a sheet of scratch paper somewhere or maybe on a napkin at a lunch table. What our ideas of marriage are, and we said, no, we need to see what God's blueprint for marriage is. He is the architect of marriage. Back in Genesis 2, we saw that we are to leave, cleave, and become one flesh. That kind of commitment is a covenant commitment. Now, what is a covenant commitment? Instead of teaching you from a biblical perspective what a covenant commitment is, I, sw- I want to read you a very short letter written from a, a young groom-to-be to his wife-to-be shortly before their marriage. And in this letter, you will hear what a covenant commitment sounds like. Listen to what he says to his wife-to-be shortly before their wedding. He says, I want you to understand and be fully aware of my feelings concerning the marriage covenant which we're about to enter. I have been taught at my mother's knee and in harmony with the word of God that the marriage vows are inviolable. And by entering into them, I'm binding myself absolutely and for life. The idea of estrangement from you through divorce for any reason at all although God allows one infidelity, will never at any time be permitted to enter into my thinking. I'm not naive in this. On the contrary, I'm fully aware of the possibility, unlikely as it now appears, that mutual incompatibility or other unforeseen circumstances could result in extreme mental suffering. If such becomes the case, I am resolved for my part to accept it as a consequence of the commitment I am now making and to bear it, if necessary, to the end of our lives together. A covenant commitment says, I will be faithful to you no matter what. That's what a covenant commitment does. Now, it might not surprise you to know, the the man who wrote that to his wife-to-be was the father of Dr. James Dobson, and that was written to Dr. Dobson's mother before his mom and dad were married. Now, if you don't know who Dr. James Dobson is, he had one of the most um, impressive ministries to the family in the last 40 or 50 years in our country, something called Focus on the Family. That was his mom and his dad. Kind of explains a lot. I I want you to see why the wedding covenant is so significant. By the way, this sermon is kind of a two-parter. I'm going to talk about covenant commitment for just a moment, and then we're going to shift gears and talk about something else and pick up where we left off last week. And I want to do this because I don't think I covered it as well as I should have when I preached on the Genesis 2 passage a few weeks ago. But I want you to see why a wedding covenant is so significant. In Scripture, there there are horizontal covenants. That's covenants between two human beings. Like, Like David and Jonathan had a covenant commitment between two humans. King David and Jonathan. And and it was like, I've got your back, you got my back. And it was a permanent covenant commitment they made to each other. So there are these horizontal covenants in Scripture. But there are also vertical covenants in Scripture. God made a covenant with Noah, saying he would never flood the earth again. Remember that? And he gave the rainbow as a sign. God made a covenant with Abram. There was the great Abrahamic covenant. So God makes these vertical covenants with man. But marriage is both. Marriage is both both a horizontal covenant and it's a vertical covenant. It's a horizontal covenant between a man and a wife, and it's the vertical covenant of the husband and wife with God. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. I don't do a lot of weddings anymore. I used to do a lot of them. But, But in almost all the weddings I did, and most of our pastors do, there are two sets of vows. There are the vows of intent. These are the vows if typically at our other campus, uh, it would be a kind of a room like this and stairs like this. And at the lower level, when the bride would come down the aisle or her husband or her father would walk her down the aisle and the, and the groom would be there. And while they're facing the pastor, the pastor would ask them, they, they were not the repeated vows, but while they faced the pastor, the pastor would ask them the vows of intent. I pulled one from a wedding I did a number of years ago, and here's what I said. The, the, the bride's name was Katie, and I asked the groom, do you take Katie to be your wedded wife? To live together in the holy estate of matrimony, do you promise to love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, keeping yourself only unto her as long as you both shall live? And looking at me, the pastor, not at his wife, not at his bride, but looking at me, he says, I do. This is the intention of his life to fulfill this vow, and in a sense, he's making this vow in front of his friends and family, but primarily it's in front of God and to God. And then I asked the 
bride the same thing, and she answers the same way I do. And this is the vertical covenant commitment before God. And then they come up the stairs, and up the stairs, the horizontal commitment takes place. At some time after a short message, you have the, the bride and the groom face each other, and they join hands, and you tell them, repeat after me. And then you say something like this to the groom, I, whatever your name is, take you, Katie, to be my wedded wife to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. And to this I promise you, talking to his bride or her to her groom, I promise you my love. And this is the horizontal covenant commitment. And so you have this vertical covenant commitment between the husband and wife before God, and you have this horizontal covenant between each other. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. These vows, if you listen to what I read to you, and I know I read that really quickly, but if you listen to them, these are not a promise of loving them today. These are a promise to love in the future, regardless of what the world brings. And and, and so the wedding vows take place. This takes place, and God joins this couple together, and Jesus says of this relationship, what God has joined together, let no man separate. But notice, at, at, and the wedding covenant commitments, those commitments are not a love for that day. That, that's, that's understood. You know, in that moment, you're loving your bride, and your bride's loving you, and you're all excited. It's a great day. But the promise is to love each other in the future, regardless of changes, regardless of health, wealth, or anything else. That's a covenant commitment. So I bet you've heard someone say, though, maybe you've said it before, or at least you've heard it said, well, I don't need a piece of paper to show my love to someone. I don't need marriage to demonstrate my love to someone. It just complicates things. It just gets in the way. Now, let me challenge you a little bit to think. I tell you that often. Listen to God's word and really, really think. So this person is saying, we can just live together. Why can't we just live together without a marriage commitment. What are they saying? They are saying, I feel love toward this person. I feel love toward them. That's all that's necessary. I love them. I don't need a piece of paper or a marriage to hold us together. And I guess if romantic love was the thing that held a marriage together, I guess you could kind of build a case for that. But what have we learned all throughout this series, if you've been here, what have we learned about real love? What is real love? Remember back in the very first week, we talked about from, from the letter of 1 John, that God showed us what love, real, real love, looks like. How did he do that? He sent Jesus, and Jesus all the way to the cross to be crucified for you and me, showed us what love looks like. It is this action of giving up self. That's the picture. That's how he showed it. Real love is not measured by how much you get out of that relationship. Real love is measured by how much you give to the relationship. There's a big difference in those two things. So real love means you're willing to give up time and resources and freedom. And listen to this last one. I put this one in all bold when I wrote it this week. And real love means you're willing to give up options all options for any potential future relationship for the good of this commitment you're making in this relationship. In other words, all future relationships are off the table when you make this kind of covenant commitment. And so what a person says when they say, I don't want to marry you, I want to live with you, that's all we need. What they're saying is, is I don't love you enough to make this kind of sacrificial commitment to you for better or worse, for life. And there's nothing to hold that relationship together, and romantic love will not hold it together because I don't care. You can pick the greatest couple in history of romantic love, and romantic love will not keep that relationship together. Only a commitment, an intent to stay together will keep that couple together when the difficult times come. Romantic love is important. It's really important. I'm not discounting how important romantic love is. I'm not saying you're marriage shouldn't have romantic love. It should. But romantic love is not what holds it together, and romantic love doesn't lead the way. Love is an act of the will. It's this, the vows of intent. I'm giving myself to you. 
And then it's followed by the passion, the romantic love. And then out of that commitment and out of that romantic love, you act in the best interest of the person to whom you've given your life. That's the picture. So I needed to say that because I don't think I said it clearly enough back in Genesis chapter 2. So that's a covenant commitment. I'll just remind you, I don't know what that says to you. I don't know what your background is, where you've come from. The reality is in our culture, we've had, because our culture has weighed in like Kramer, we've all made mistakes and there's a lot of problems, but I want you to know that whatever it is, you come today, God will, as I said in the very beginning, wash you white as snow. And that's really good news. So let's pick up now from where we were last week. So it's kind of a two-part sermon. That's one thing aside. Now I'm going to shift gears and we're going to pick up right where we left off last week. Remember, we were in Ephesians 5 and we ended with verse 21. This is God's blueprint for marriage. And now we're going to begin to unpack God's blueprint for marriage. Now, if that made you mad, what I just said, I I don't apologize for that. I believe that's what God's word teaches. If that made you mad, wait till you hear what I say next. (laughs) So... Let's pick up where we left off back in Ephesians 5, verse 21. We're going to continue to unpack God's blueprint for marriage. Here's what he says. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself, gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body, For this reason, now he quotes Genesis 2, for this reason a man man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, let me just point out one thing. I know there's a whole lot there. We're not unpacking all of that today. There's a whole lot there. But if, if you listened carefully, one thing you will notice There's a whole lot more verses in there telling the husband what he's supposed to do than there are verses telling the wife what she's supposed to do. So with that said, gals, you're getting a break. Because I'm going to preach to the wives today for the rest of our time, but I've already taken at least a third of my time up. So you're only getting two-thirds of the deal. Next week, guys, you're getting the whole ball of wax. Because we need it. Men need it. Just telling the truth. So we're going to unpack this. And look at the wife's responsibilities and, in some cases, roles. Now, the first thing that I read to you about the wife um, sticks out like a sore thumb. And so I'm just, I'm just going to, here's what it says. It says, wives, you should submit to your husband. Now, before you freak out and get all mad at me and yell and scream, for, by the way, I'm not going to apologize for anything I say. I'm just going to teach God's word. And if you've got a problem with it, your problem's with God's word, not with me. I'm just saying. That's the way it is. All right. Yeah, yeah, as the tomatoes come. That's okay. That's all right. I'll just point out, I'm going to talk about submission on a day while my wife's in Colorado, (laughs) seeing our daughter. So there you go. I don't know if she realized I was doing this and she left, or I just took the cowardly way and thought, I'm preaching on this while she's gone. But this is God's blueprint. So, So if you have not heard God's teaching on this, you come into this service today with all kind of things the world has said to you through the years and all kind of thinking. I'm going to ask you, if you will, listen as closely as you can and as accurately, can, as accurately as you can to what God's word says. Okay? I don't care. It doesn't matter what I think or what I say. What does God say? So listen to what God says in this. So this whole thing about submission, wives submitting to your husband has to be understood in light of two things. First of all, it has to be understood in light of the husband's role and responsibility. That's next week's sermon, but let me just talk about it for this long. Guys, it says that man is the head of the home. He is the leader, but not the kind of leader that most people think, and it's why the culture gets all messed up on this thing. He's to be the leader, but he is to be the servant leader. That's clear from Scripture. He is to be a servant leader. And that's a whole different ballgame. He is to love his wife like Christ loved the church. Well, how much was that? He died for the church. So, so he, I, I, I thought of this 
I talk about roles create responsibility. I've said that a lot, but this weekend I was writing, something hit me that I think helps us understand this a little bit better. And so let me say it and see if this resonates with you at all. Roles create responsibilities, not privileges. Your role in marriage creates responsibility in your marriage, not privileges in your marriage. So the husband is called to lead, and so he's responsible to lead his family. That's the picture in this beautiful one flesh relationship where God says one plus one equals one. The two will become one. The husband is to be the leader. He is responsible before God. Now, I love how Tony Evans says this. He has such a great way of saying things. Tony Evans says, women, submission is this. God gives you permission to duck when he slaps your husband upside the head. <laughs> because the husband is responsible for the family. I will talk more about what that doesn't mean in just a minute. So understand this, first of all, in light of that, in light of the husband's role. And secondly, understand that in light of what we learned last week. Understand this idea of wives submit to your husbands in light of what we learned last week. Well, what did we learn last week? We learned that submission is to be the lifestyle of every believer, not just the wife. Remember verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. When we see the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his glory and all of his wonder and all of his power and all of his mercy and all of his forgiveness and all of his grace and all the things we talked about that, and we see him in light of all that, then we submit ourselves to him, we surrender ourselves to him, and out of submitting ourselves to him, then we consider other people as more important than ourselves. All of us as believers, men and women alike, married, not married, that should be the attitude of our hearts for all of us. In Philippians 2, it says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. One translation says, you should have the same mind as that of Christ. That's the attitude. I'm submitting to other people. I consider other people more important than myself. So we're all called to that kind of attitude. So Paul concludes this sentence in verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And if you remember from last week, that's the end of a long statement. And then he finishes that. He says, submit to another, one another out of reverence for Christ. And then in verse 22, after he says, submit to one another, in verse 22, wives submit to husbands. In chapter 6, verse 1, children submit to parents. In chapter 6, verse 5, slaves to masters. That's the idea. That's the order he's laying out. It's a matter of order and culture and how we do things. You know, I can't get through a sermon on marriage without quoting Howard Hendricks at least once. Here's what Hendricks says about this idea of submission. He says, we have overemphasized submission to the husband, and we have underemphasized submission to the Lord. A woman who can submit herself to the Lord is a woman who can submit herself to her husband. So we're all called to submit ourselves to the Lord first. We all are. But what Hendricks is saying here is, ladies, if you have a hard time submitting yourself to your husband, your problem is not in verse 22, your problem's in verse 21. That's what he's saying. So I would just encourage you to look at that and think through that. Now, I want to point out one thing here because he says, submit yourself to the Lord first. So, so what I would say to any wife, because there's always, there's always exceptions to the rule, and I, I don't believe God is talking here about an abusive situation where a wife is being abused by her husband. You don't submit yourself to that. Or if the guy is asking you to do something that is illegal or immoral with him, you submit to the Lord first, and the Lord would not have you to submit to that. But outside of those kind of things, your heart should be one of submission to your husband. Now, what does that not mean? That does not mean that, women, you have a lack of fulfillment in your life. That's not the point at all. It doesn't mean the husband makes all the decisions. I'll give you an example of that in just a moment. It doesn't mean the husband's always right. I only know of one home where the husband's always right. That really should have been better than that, but that's okay, you know. <laughs> I would only say that when Josie's gone, too. I would say. <laughs> it doesn't mean the husband's a dictator. It certainly doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean the wife loses her identity at all. And it certainly does not mean the wife is inferior. Guys, if you even have that much thought, even that much thought, that this means the wife is inferior, you could not be more wrong. That is not what scripture is teaching in any way, 
shape, or form. That's not the picture at all. None of those things are true. What it means is you're responsible before God for the decisions of your family. However they're made, the responsibility falls on you. Now, let me give you an, an, an example of how I think the family should work. And I've, I've gotten that wrong a million times. I'll tell you one time when I got it right. When Josie and I were young, we had a guy come to our house, and he did this presentation, uh, a financial presentation, to try to get us to invest with him. He had a whole stable full of athletes. It's just a stable full of them. And he comes and he does this whole presentation. And, and I'm kind of interested in it. I'm listening to it. Josie's listening to it. And, and, and we had been taught, there was a guy then we used to hear every year named Larry Burkett, who was kind of the Dave Ramsey of that day. And he was a great Christian guy. And we'd heard him teach on Christian finances. And one of the things that we'd heard from Larry Burkett, he had said to the, to the guys at the conferences we went to, was, guys, you better listen to your wives. You may be the financial person, you may be the number person, but your wife knows things you don't know, you better listen to her. And I just kind of tucked that away in the back of my head, and I'm sure Josie probably had it in the front of hers. And, and so we, this guy comes that night, and he gives us this big, long presentation of what we should do investment-wise, and he wants us to go with him. And I said, well, I'll let you know in a few days. And he left. And I, I'll promise you, he probably isn't even out of our driveway yet. And Josie looked at me and said, I want, and by the way, Josie knows nothing about, at that time, knew nothing about finances. And she said, I don't want anything to do with that guy. And I said, why? And she said, I don't know. And I remember what Larry Burkett said. And Josie and I talked about it. We spent a couple of days talking about it. And I kind of wanted to go with the guy, to be honest with you. But I remember what Burkett said and what Josie thought. And you know what I thought? I'm going with what Josie's saying called the guy and I said, nah, we're going to go a different direction. And the guy got kind of angry and pushed back a little bit. Why not? Da, da, da. I said, no, we're going another direction. That guy later went to prison for embezzling from all of his clients and took down a lot of athletes with him. My point is, I could have tried to be a dictator in the home. Well, this is what I think is. That's not what this says when it says wives be submissive to your husbands. Guys, it doesn't mean you're the king of the house and dictator of the house. And that's not how the relationship is to function. So number one, though, wives, that doesn't take you out of the responsibility. You still submit to your husband and his leadership in the home. I was responsible. Either way we went, either decision, before God, I was responsible. Here's the second thing. Be a helper to your husband. Genesis 2.18, the Lord said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. We've talked about that word suitable a lot. Let me talk about helper for just a minute. We touched on it this long, but let me just remind you what that word means. In, in, in our English vocabulary, we hear the word helper and we think subordinate. We think a gopher. We think of somebody that's just there to do the dirty work and clean up the stuff behind us and there's no authority, and there's no position to it. That's not what this word means. That's how most people interpret it and some men interpret it that way, but guys, if you do, you're wrong. It's not what the word is. In fact, I've mentioned this in another sermon, but it, it, in scripture, that word I think every single time there might be one exception in the Old Testament when the word is used, it's referring to God being the helper, not somebody subordinate. It, it, it talks about he is our help and our shield a number of times. That's the word. God is our help. Same word that she is to help, we, be a helper to the husband. One passage describes it as God helping King David to become King David. And how about this one in Psalm 121? I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I think if the maker of heaven and earth is where our help comes from, if he is our helper, I think it's a strong word, not a weak word. Do you see that? And, and in fact, if you can take this from Scripture, and, and it appears that the word helper here is the stronger person helping the weaker person. And in a very real sense in marriage, that's often the case. The stronger one helping, the weaker one. You get, you get the picture. H how do you help? Help him by supporting him. Stand with him. Every husband needs this from his wife. And I will say to wives, I'll go negative here just for one second. Wives, don't ever ridicule or take down your husband in public. It is a horrible thing to do for your relationship. Build him up. Don't tear him down in front of other people. Proverbs 31 says, an excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. If you take him down in public, 
he will not trust you. Support him through the seasons of life. I spent more time on that in the first service because in the first service we have more couples that have been through the seasons of life, but we change, our needs change as husbands in the seasons of life and our helper changes in how she helps us and all of her strength. And then I would say to the wives too, and this is part of being his helper, let him dream and encourage your husband to dream. When, when we were younger in our marriage, this was a real point of um, contention at times for us because I, I'm a dreamer. I think a lot and dream a lot. At, I tend to do, I'm a night person. I tend to do it at night and Josie would be ready to go to sleep and almost fall asleep and I'd come to her with some grand idea for life. And in the beginning, it scared her to death. And uh, she became, and she talks about this, she became my dream squasher. Every time I bring one up, she'd just smash it. And then she learned after a while, if she would just let me dream, number one, it was good for me, and number two, usually by lunch the next day, I've forgotten what I was dreaming about. <laughs> I think that's true of most of us, but we need that freedom to dream and think and be creative, and I would encourage you to be your helper to your husband to do that. Here's the third thing, love your husband. Uh, when Paul wrote to a young pastor named Titus, marriage in the Roman Empire was in a horrible uh, situation. And Paul begins in chapter 2, verse 1. He says to him, you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. In other words, you teach God's blueprint. Don't teach not what sound doctrine. You teach what is according to God's blueprint for life, not just in marriage, but in marriage as well. And then he says in verse 3 of chapter 2, likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Now, I don't have time to unpack all that. I just want to read you a quote from Barbara Rainey. Barbara Rainey is married to Dennis Rainey. They've been involved in family ministry for, I think, since the mid-70s. A great couple. Here's what she says about loving your husband. A good description of the kind of love your husband needs is unconditional acceptance. In other words, accept your husband just as he is, an imperfect person. Now, I will repeat again, we're not talking about abuse when you talk about accepting him as he is. We're talking about a normal situation here. Accept your husband. He, there's no perfect husband. Love him, accept him as he is. Now, she continues the quote. It won't be on the screen, but she continues and says, <coughs> excuse me, love also means being committed to a mutual fulfilling sexual relationship. We'll save that for another message in a few weeks. Now, that's three points. There's one more point. And this is the one I, I, I really want to emphasize. And, and when I was a young husband, I became aware of my need for this thing from Josie. And, and I learned it in a very selfish moment, in a moment when I was angry, in a moment when, I, when life was more about what I wanted than meeting her needs. But we haven't been married a long, long time. And, and I have to set up this stage of life. This is a long time ago. And some of you won't understand this era, but we didn't have the internet. And there was no online banking. And we had something called checkbooks. Yeah. And Josie had a checkbook and I had a checkbook for the same account. And I had this, this need in me, and I think I got it from my dad, that like, I call it stewardship. She calls it fanaticism. But I needed to know and I needed to balance. And to balance a checkbook, for those of you young people, you actually wrote your checks down and you put them in a register. At the end of the month, you had to add everything up and subtract and figure out exactly how much money and you would balance it with the statement you got in the mail from the, you actually got real mail too, from, from the bank. Well, Josie had a hard time remembering to write down the checks that she wrote. And she, Josie's the most unselfish person I know. She never spent a lot of money on herself. She would just forget to post the checks. And so, brilliant, I got her checks with carbon copies behind them. And so she would write the checks and there'd be a carbon copy. But very often I'd go to balance the checkbook and not only would a check not be posted, but the carbon copy would be gone. And I was, <laughs> I had a bad temper when I was a young man. That's all I'm going to say. I was, and I was, one of these times I'm trying to balance the checkbook and, and I, I, I couldn't because there were a couple of checks missing. And it was funny, we had this argument, and Josie's up on the top of the stairs of the landing, we're in Seattle, living in Seattle, and I remember yelling at her, if there's one thing that's going to happen in this marriage, you're going to respect me. 
That's a fine way to get it, isn't it? <laughs> we can laugh about it now. It wasn't a laughing matter in that moment. But that's, that's the thing I needed. And, and I really didn't know it. But what I said was right. I mean, what wasn't correct in the way I did it. But I needed respect. The husband, wives, respect your husband. She, he needs that. Now, that, that's the point. Now, I, I want to show you something. Look on the screen for a second. Here's the passage. That's the whole passage of, of Ephesians chapter 5. Never in that passage does it tell the wife to love her husband. 1 Peter chapter 3 is a passage to wives. Never does it tell wives to love their husbands. Colossians 3 is a passage to wives. Never does it tell the wives to love their husband. Even the one I quoted you a moment ago when I said, love your husband, and I quoted Barbara Rainey, even in that one to Titus, is Titus telling the older women, teach the young women to love their husbands. There's not really, you're not really commanded to love your wife. Now, the guys are told to love, I mean, the husbands are told to love their wives. But in this whole passage here, unpacking God's blueprint for marriage, he doesn't say, love your husband. But verse 33, he says, and the wife must respect her husband. Every husband, and I, I just cried out as a young man thinking it that way. See, I, I'm interpreting that moment that Josie wasn't doing, posting those checks. I interpret it as a respect issue for Josie is, what's the deal? I just forgot to write the check number down. And you, and you can see that. I understand that now that I'm a little more mature, not too much more mature. But it's something we desperately need. We need our wives to value us and admire us and respect us. If a wife does not respect her husband, we're missing something we desperately need. And I will tell you, we are an insecure lot. A lot of husbands will try to act real secure. Yeah, well, okay, maybe a little bit. But underneath it all, there's insecurity in all of us. There's a wonderful scene in the movie Saving, Saving Private Ryan. And, and he's at the cemetery. And the movie opens that way. He's at the cemetery there, the military cemetery. And he flashes back, and you have the whole movie where these guys are going to find him and bring him back and save him, and guys are giving their lives so he can be saved. And and after all the war part of the movie, at the end of the movie, he flips back to the cemetery again, and he's there. All of his family behind him, his wife closest, and he's at the grave. He falls to his knees, and he's very emotional. And his wife walks up, and he looks at his wife, and he says to his wife, wife. Tell me I've led a good life. Tell me I'm a good man. I I don't think the movie makers intended this, but they touched on a great biblical principle there. Because that man needed to hear from his wife, not from his friends, not from his buddies, not from his co-workers, not from anybody else. He needed to hear from his wife that he was a good man and she respected him. And the older I get, this true confession, the older I get, and the more of my life is spent, the more where I become that the woman I have given my life to and the woman who has given her life to me, I need to hear from her that I'm a good man, that she respects me. It's built in us. And wives, your husband needs that from you. No one else can give that to him but you. He needs your respect. Without it, there's something missing in his life. Marriage is really wonderful. It's it's incredibly hard at times, but it's incredibly wonderful at times. It's a wonderful covenant commitment to God and to each other. And it's led by this commitment, this intent of the heart to commit to one another. And it's made even better by romantic love. It makes it a whole lot more fun. And when we have that kind of relationship where we're living in the best interest of the other person, that kind of marriage thrives and God uses that marriage. And you remember the intent and the purpose of all this? Paul said, I'm talking about Christ and the church. Our marriages should be a picture to the world around us of Christ and the church. And wives, God says to you, 
submit to your husbands as you submit to the Lord first. Be his helper, strong helper. Not weak, not silent, but there, there's, there's nothing in any of these things that keep you from being all the things you want to be in life. But just be careful to not let all the things you do in life keep you from being these things in your marriage. You hear the difference in those two things? You can do anything. Just make sure that anything doesn't get in the way of being the wife that you're supposed to be. And I'll say the same thing to the husbands next week. So be that kind of helper. Be his lover. And respect him. And that will be a picture to the world around us. And I'll say to you wives, as you do that, as you yield to the spirit of God in your life and God builds this. By the way, I'm not saying this is easy. This is hard stuff. But as you do, 1 Peter 3 says that God will make you even more beautiful on the inside than you already are on the outside. My prayer for you is that God will help you in this journey and that God will help us as husbands as well. And we'll be looking at singles in the next few weeks sometimes. Also, I will say to our students, I hope you're hearing this because this should impact your life later and the decisions you make about marriage moving forward. But I pray that as a church family, God will heal marriages and restore marriages and grow our marriages stronger than they are now so we'll be a picture of Jesus and the church because marriage is about that.